Wow, what a powerful, powerful service today. Have you enjoyed yourself so far? Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're still in the series, um, uh, the F- Set Free series that we're talking about. Uh, and I believe this is like, yeah, it is week number four. And as we get ready to do this, I'd like you to turn to uh, two passages of Scripture. Two passages of Scripture. Go ahead and turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. That's over in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 7. And then I'd like you to turn over the New Testament to Luke chapter 15 in the Gospels. So you get in there. And so our, our foundational text, you don't need to turn there. It'll be up on your screen. Uh, we, can, we can just kind of go through it. Our foundational text for the series is John chapter 8. For the sake of time, I really need to get into it. So let me uh, begin reading. Uh, Jesus continued. Actually, I want to I set this up before I start reading. Um, it's really important as you read through John chapter 8 to recognize the two groups of people who Jesus is talking to in this passage. Like there, there, are, there are two types of people in this passage. Well, actually, I guess three. There's, there's believers, and, and you're going to see people who become believers in this passage. And by the way, John chapter 8 is the same chapter where the, where the woman was caught in adultery. You remember that? And, that, and all the religious leaders, they picked up stones to, to stone her. Um, and not in a Jerry Brown kind of way. I'm talking about like with rocks, like, you know. And so they, they begin to, uh, like the, and, then, and then Jesus came along. And he says, you know, those who are without sin cast the first stone. You guys remember the story? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's in this passage. And then, you know, every one of them, one by one, they walk away, and, and the only one left standing is the only one who really had the right to cast the stone, Jesus. And then Jesus looks at the woman, and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, I don't see anybody. He said, well, then neither do I accuse you. And he looked at her through those incredible eyes of love, and he says, go and sin no more. And, uh, and then right after that, right after that, this famous verse, Jesus, I think he springboards off of that, and he looks around at these people that he's talking to, and he says, you see what I did in her? I can do it in you. I can do it in you. Right? And then he says, I am the light of the world. Anyone who... Um, you know, follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but but have the light of life. And he looks at me and he says, "What I did in her, I can bring light to your situation. I can bring light to your marriage. I can bring light to your home. I can bring light to your life. I got light for you." Okay. And uh, so there, are, but there, are, but there's another group of people he's talking to in John chapter eight, and those are unbelievers. These are non-believing Jews, and they are only there for one purpose, and that is to disrupt him, to challenge him with scripture. And, and, to, and to kind of show him out, so to speak, right? And then there's another group of people. They're just people. They're just seekers. They don't know what they believe. They're just out there checking things out, you know? And maybe that's really where you're at today. Maybe you're just, like, you don't know. Like, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't not believe in God. You just don't have that real intimate relationship with him. That's, I love that you're here today. I love that you're here today. Amen. So, but, 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 but Jesus is talking. So he looks at one group. So you're going to see this throughout John chapter 8. We're not going to go to the whole thing. I challenge you to read it when you get a chance. But Jesus is popcorning in and out of different conversations. And that's really a dynamic that you need to understand when looking through John chapter 8. Like for one group, he's talking to them because after that woman who, who was set free, like they, they, it says, and said so many of them believed. Like many of them believed. And so Jesus is is springboarding in and out of conversations and he looks at that group of people who are believers now and he says to them listen if you, you know the truth and the truth will, sh- will make you free but then he tells another group of people who are not believers who are bent on disruption and he looks at them and he says you know you you, you think you know who my father is you don't know who my father is but I know who your father is your father is the devil now, I can imagine Peter at that point looks over at John and says, there goes another offering. Like, oh, we're not going to get anything today. I can just see it, right? And uh, I mean, how, how, by the way, how, how many of you would like that on your coffee mug? <laughs> like, well, what, what does it say on your coffee mug? The devil's my daddy, John chapter 8, verse 44. Right? You, it's not something you want to embroider on your pillow. So Jesus springboard, you know, it's, it's important to understand the dynamic and, and I'm not going to get into that anymore. But in, so John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31, okay. Um, actually, I have it here. I want to read it in this New King James Version here. Watch this. He says to them, verse uh, 31, 
He says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Liars. <laughs> anyone. How can you say you will be you will be made free. Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, here's the title of our series, you shall be free, free indeed. Amen. So last week we talked about how we sometimes knowingly or unknowingly will open doors to basically give the enemy access to come in and cause disruption into our lives. That, that can be done in many ways. We talked about, we went through scriptures, talked about windows, doors that are open. Remember that one play, place over there in Ephesians, he says, don't, don't give the devil a foothold. So, so these are open doors that we, you know, sometimes not even knowingly, we're, we're giving him opportunity. Things through like disobedience, compromise, fear, Right? And it gives the enemy the opportunity to come in and bring influence, negative influence into our, in, into our lives. We, we talked about, and I mean, this, this theme goes really all through Scripture, this, this warning about these open doors. I mean, it's from, it's from Genesis to maps. I mean, it, it doesn't, and everything in between, it just doesn't really go away. We see it all the way through. Uh, this uh, week, we're talking about how to keep those doors shut in your life. And I, I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm, I'm saying we're all just a little bit pitiful in some areas, but, but, the, but the Word will speak to your heart. The Word works in you. The Bible, is, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the finest center of soul and spirit, right? So, so, so God knows how to work into your heart and life. He'll take care of those. To, to keep those doors slammed shut and, and have walk in freedom in those areas of your life. And yet, and yet, these warnings often go unheeded by believers because of some areas in their life that they choose to ignore, just like the believers in John chapter 8 who were in denial that they even had issues. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. I believe, I believe you're already there. Now, this is God talking through the prophet Jeremiah. So this is the Lord speaking. And I know some of you are thinking, well, this is the Old Testament pastor. Hang on. I get it. I get it. Okay, because when we talk about freedom, it's like there's a, a rule that you can't talk about, you, get, you can't read from the Old Testament. I don't know where people get that from. It doesn't make any sense to me, but uh, it, it is out there anyway. So, so the Lord is talking to his people, and he says, in, beginning in verse number 8, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods you do not know? Aren't you glad you came to church today? I.e., sin. Okay, and then verse 10, come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name. In other words, you go to church and you say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name? I, I read this, guys, this past week when I was preparing, and I, it was one of those wow scripture moments for me. It's like, wow. Like, like, can you imagine, could you imagine God talking to you like this? He says, and yet, he says, has this house which is called by my name become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it. Like, like you, you think you're slipping under the radar. I know what's going on in your life. I know those areas that need to be corrected. He's saying you got all this junk in your life, and yet you, you'll go to church and you'll say, you know, we're free. We're delivered. Well, I guess the question is, free to do what? Like, like how crazy would it be to, to show up to church, serve, read your Bible, worship, pray, do all those things that Christians do, and yet continue to ignore those areas of compulsive behavior that you can't seem to get away from in your life? You say, well, once again, Pastor, I appreciate this, but that's Jeremiah. It's not New Testament. All right, but, but isn't that reason why the Apostle Paul wrote an entire epistle to the church of Galatia about this very same thing? Almost every chapter in there, right? 
And didn't, didn't the Apostle Paul already say in Romans chapter 6, what more shall we say then? Should we continue to sin because we are no longer under the law but under grace? And then he answers his own question, absolutely not. Like that's crazy talk. Galatians 5.1. So Christ has truly set us free. That's good news, isn't it? Now, make sure that you, and here's the title of today's message, stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. You really need to go back and get the last couple of messages on this to, to kind of get caught up. You can do that online. So, so far in this series, we've been talking about, we've been staying pretty close to how the enemy will, will influence believers into bondage because of areas of of their life that have, that have gone unchecked, uh, like this, through a spirit of lust or through a, you know, a spirit of uh, deviation, some kind of, some kind of spirit of fear or some, something like that that's gone unchecked in their life and really about really unanswered sin that we allow to continue to ferminate down in our life. To, but here today we're seeing how the Apostle Paul is saying, but there's another area of bondage that believers can get sucked up in in their life, and it's through religious legalism. And I know some of you are like, Pastor, what is that? That's when your traditions about God become the foreground and your relationship with God becomes the peripheral. Are you, track, are you tracking with me today? And in other words, it's more about the traditions than it is the relationship uh, with, with God. And, and he says it, it shouldn't be that way. And by the way, God views, you know, spiritual, uh, religious legalism as a type of sin also. It, it's one of the most subtle and effective tools that the enemy keeps in his arsenals to use against uh, believers to keep them in bondage. And w- one of the things that we've been looking at throughout this series is that you can't truly be free indeed until you, if you don't think you can indeed be in bondage. We've we got to stop and consider that. So I want to take you through uh, a, a formula or a, pro- a process. It's, it's a four-part outline. And I'm going to go on, out on a limb, and I, I'm, I'm going to just say that uh, if you'll get a hold of this outline, it is, it is so important, not just because I'm giving it to you, it's something that you can literally use for the rest of your life to stay free in those areas of your life that, can, that continue to hold you back. Are you, are you interested in hearing what this is? Amen. Okay, if we're going to be close, we have, to, we have to stay close and keep up this morning, okay? All right. So Luke chapter 15, you're already there. This is the story of the prodigal son. It's a very popular passage of Scripture. Uh, I, it's the one where, remember the son, Jesus tells the story of the, of, the, of, the, of the younger son who goes to his father, demands his inheritance, and he sets out to a foreign land, and he squanders, he blows his inheritance, makes bad choices, gets around the wrong people, and then he, there's a famine in the land because that's the, uh, that's, that's the process of bondage, right? And there's always freedom, then freedom sometimes spurs bondage when we let our hair down and it brings us back to, to bondage again. And so you got to really watch out for that. He, he blows it, gets around the wrong people, makes really, really bad decisions, ends up in a hog pen working for somebody uh, feeding, feeding hogs. That, that's basically the story, okay? Uh, and then he comes back to his father and they have a celebration story. I, I'm going to, we're going we're gonna to just kind of go through it slowly here. So Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse number 11, It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the the estate. So he divided his property between them. Notice the words between them. That's going to come back for us today, okay? Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, uh, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. I know some of you are thinking like, That's just like Saturday nights, okay? Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And look at these words. He began to be in need. So here's, here's, if you're taking notes, there's this four-part outline. Here's here's part number one of the outline. If if you're really serious about 
staying free. Number one, admit that you need freedom. I- admit that you need freedom. I know this is really hard for some people. And can I just say it's really hard for guys especially to, to really kind of buck that pride and to admit, you know what, I, I got issues. I got things going on in my life, and, and I, don't seem, I, don't, I can't seem to get any power over it. And, and it's really tough, but can I just tell you, it's one of the most courageous, boldest steps that you can make as a believer. The son in our story isn't able to do that right away. His pride is, is holding on to him, and he's now trying to fix everything within his own power and strength. And by the way, can I just tell you that that is one of the roots of pride is that relying on your own strength instead of God's strength. And so this this son, he he thinks to himself, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fix this on my own. I'm going to get hired on with this guy who owns this this pig farm and I'm going to go out and feed. And that's exactly what he did. He, He ends up in the hog pit pig pen feeding swine all because he was pig headed like some of you are like you're gonna be on your way home today and going I oh I get it yeah pig swine I get it you know and by the way is it is it possible for a pig to pull his hamstring I'm just wondering I don't even know but <laughs> not even sure I don't know a lot of these things come to my brain you know like like if a bunch of cats jumped on top of each other would it still be called a dog pile like I don't know it's weird. Don't even take that off my preaching time this morning. All right. So, so watch verse number 16. But he, but he longed, that was about as funny as this sermon's going to get right there. So if you didn't laugh, you're in trouble the rest of the way, okay? He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but nobody gave anything to him. Here's key phrase right here in verse 17. When he came to his senses. And I'm saying this morning, if, if you really want to experience freedom in those areas of your life, you got to get into a God moment where you say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done allowing my pride to keep me stuck in the hog pen of life. I'm done with that. It's an important step. Verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food enough to spare? And I, and, and here I am starving to death. Translation, he's not living the free, set free, blessed life that belongs to him because he's made some bad choices. He's opened the window. He's opened the door. So number one, to freedom, staying free, is admit that you need freedom. Here's number two. We're going to move through these really quickly. Humbly repent to God and others. Humbly repent to God, and I added, and others. And others. Verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So far, so good. Okay? Notice he realized that 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 the key path to his freedom was repenting not only to God, heaven, but his Father. This is a big gap for a lot of Christians because there's a lot of believers who are like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll repent to God, but I, I'm not about calling someone on the phone and saying, you know, I, I messed up. I need help. Can you pray for me? Right? Because the pride gets in the way. We don't like that. It's easy to repent to God in, in the privacy of your own living room. But he says, he says, to, to, to God and, and others. I believe it's why so many Christians choose not to be committed to the local church, by the way, is, is because they don't want to be accountable to anybody. And living a set-free life involves accountability to not only God but other people who, who can come alongside of you and grow together. And so they don't, they don't want to do that. But I'm telling you, a major deception of the enemy and one of the key elements for keeping people in bondage is not, is not being able to, to repent. I'm going I'm to talk about repentance in a little bit because repentance, especially in, in the modern church world that we live in, has gotten a nasty rap. All right? There's actually a, an ideology out there that says that uh, for, for, for born-again believers today that repentance is, is technically invalid. It's not even necessary. Like, okay, so you, you got born again, you got saved, and here's the idea when you got saved, you got redeemed from sin. Now, that, that includes the sins that you committed, the sins that you're involved in right now, and the ones you haven't even done yet. Okay, all right. Let's go there. That's, that, we're, we're good so far, right? But here, here's where they'll take it. They'll say, and that means that that invalidates the repentance process. Listen, if, if, 
If, re, if, if repentance is not for saved people, then Jesus mix, misspoke when he told five of the seven churches in Revelation, repent. Yeah, yeah. Repent. Yeah. Now, I think one of the reasons why is because repentance or repent is just so misunderstood. When we think of the word repent, we think, well, uh, it means, you know, coming to God, saying sorry, and then now all of a sudden you have access again to heaven. Like, like it's a hotel room key card, door key card that turns on and off and, you know, you, you pay up, you, you, you get, you're all paid up, you get access to the room, but if your credit card fails, you don't got any more access. They'll shut that dude off. Okay, that, that's, not, that's not what this is. The, the, the Greek word for repent is metanoia. It's, it's actually two words, and I don't want to get too technical on you. Meta, we understand that. It's where you get the word metamorphosis. It means change. Noia means mind. It means change your mind. Literally, it means make, make the decision that you are going to begin moving in another direction. I, uh, uh, and, and it involves uh, repenting not only to God but other people. Um, I, in Bible college, um, the, the first year of Bible college, first semester actually, uh, if you're going to be a pastor, this pastoral studies class that, that I was involved in, the, uh, my professor made this comment to a, to a group of people who were going to be in ministry and leadership, pastors, whatever, in churches, and he says, listen, all you guys are going to be in ministry and leadership, there's two things that you've got to understand, that if you're going to be in ministry, you've got you to get used to being alone. You got to use it because you can't get too close to the people you're leading. This was the, the idea. He said, if you get too close to the people you're leading, you're not able to let your hair down because if you do let your hair down, you're going to get up there and you're going to be under the anointing, speaking, teaching, and they're not going to believe it because it's just you. Ah, that wasn't for me. That's what happened to Jesus, they say, right, in his own hometown. They, when they look at him and say, oh, this is just the carpenter's son. So they, he says, if you, if you want to bypass that, just get used to not being just being alone in ministry. And I thought, I don't want to be in ministry. I'm going to be all alone. I'm not going to have any friends. I'm going to have to move to a bayou in Louisiana called Bayou Self. I don't want any part of that, right? And the second thing he said, listen, the second thing is if you're going to be in ministry, you can never let the people you're leading see your weaknesses. No one wants to follow someone who's got issues. And you're all looking at the wrong pastor, I'll tell you that right now, Right? No one wants to follow someone who's got issues. And, and, and I guess that verse in, in, the, in the New Testament that says, you know, confess your faults, your sins to one another, pray for one another, you might be healed, didn't apply to pastors. And so I thought, all right, well, I guess that's how you're supposed to be in ministry. I, I remember we were actually in this, in this building right here. We'd moved in. Uh, someone came to me um, one time after service and said, hey, listen, pastor, I got, I'm having an issue. Well, not me necessarily. It's this other person. They, they shared me with him what this person was going through. They said, I can't really tell them about it. They got this thing going on in their life. I, I'm, I, I want to tell them to do this and, and that they'll be delivered from that, but I really feel like I can't talk to them about that because it's a sensitive issue. So just pray for me that God will like, intervene and do something. And I said, yeah, I'll, absolutely, right? And, and she, oh, by the way, you can't say anything to them because then they'll know I told you. Don't you love that, by the way? It's like pressure, right? <laughs> okay, so you see that person walking by, you're like, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, you're trying to think about it, right? So I'm up there preaching. The following week, I'm up there preaching, right? I'm up here, right here, right here. I'm up here, I'm talking. And, and right in the middle of my message, I look over and I see that person. I see that person that they were talking about. And I said this. I said, you know, the Spirit of the Lord just told me to tell someone in here that if you'll do you got this and that going on, and if you'll do this, that he'll deliver you. And I went on with my message. Went home the following week. The following Saturday, I'm preparing. I'm in my study preparing, and, uh, and it wasn't coming together. I couldn't, like my brain wasn't on, like it wasn't firing on all cylinders, and I just started to get to pray, God, I need, your, I need your help. I need you to speak to me. I need, I need to hear what you want, what you're saying. And I did hear the Spirit of God say this. You don't need me to talk to you. You already know what I'm going to say. And I knew what he's talking about because I made that up. I was trying to help someone, but I made it up, and I used God's name to do it. And I tell you what, it's just I felt it. I felt the gravity of that. And I said, I'm sorry, I repent. And he says, okay, I accept that, but you need to, you need to confess that to the church. 
And I was like, God, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm the pastor. God, you need to go to Bible school. They cover this in the first semester, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you don't even understand. I'll, I'll show you my notes. I, I got them written out. I got them, I shall tell you, like that. And then I was starting to make a deal with God. You know how you do. Okay, God, I'll do it. And like, if, if a pink Mary Kay car comes down my street between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, then I'll know it's from you, Right? <laughs> Like you throw off this fleece, right? But I did it. I did it because I was desperate. I didn't want to tell him. I was, I was grasping for straws. I was like, okay, God, I tell you what. If someone from our church brings that up and asks me about it, then I'll know it's from you. It wasn't any sooner than I said that and Taffy walks into my study and she has a plate of nachos, which is, which is sermon study food, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows that. And she, she walks in, and she hands it, and I said, oh, thank you, baby. And she turns around, she starts to walk away, and she stops. She says, hey, I've been wondering. <laughs> oh, did, did God tell you who that person was, or did you, it was just a random name? <laughs> the next day, I showed up at church. I knew what I had to do. I stood up there, and I said, listen, before I start this message, i got to confess something to you. I said something that God told me to say, and he didn't tell me to say that. I was using it. I didn't know I was being a manipulative. I, I, was, I didn't know I was being manipulative, but it was. And I, I ask you to forgive me. I'll, I'll do better like that. I, I, I can't remember what the sermon was about that day. But can I tell you, I have never in my life felt the presence of God in the middle of my message like I did that day. Yeah. So, so that's what he says, Right? So, number one, admit you, you need freedom. Number two, humbly repent to God and others. And, and number three, daily choose to reject Satan's lies. For some of you, you need to do this every single day. If we all should. Get into a habit every day. Reject the enemy's lies. Because for some of you, that dude's going to start talking to you before you get out of the parking lot. He's going to tell you, see, you didn't get anything out of that. Another Sunday wasted. Think of what you could have done today. See, that wasn't for you. Right? And he'll just, he's going to start talking. I'm telling you, listen to me, church, please hear me. Get into the habit of daily rejecting Satan's lies. Verse number 18, he said, I've sinned against heaven and against you, Father. So far, so good. Right? Look what he says in verse 19, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son lie. It's a lie. Who told him that? His father didn't tell him that. He's hearing it though, isn't he? He was in an area of bondage. He, he, was, he was in bondage to insecurity and he was, he was in bondage to, to, to rejection. Right? He, he was in bondage to a spirit of shame and guilt. His father never said that. And by the way, he's not the only person in our story who was in bondage to lies. The older son is in bondage. Let, 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 I'm going to fast forward. I'm, I'm going to speed talk this one, right? Ready? Here it goes. He comes back from sending his hand on your side. No longer will you be called your son. Make me one of your higher servants, right? And, and, and before he can even get out of his mouth, his father turns around and says, hurry, bring the, bring the best robe and put it on him. Watch that robe. Get the, get the ring for his finger, shoes for his feet. For this, my son, who was lost and is found again, was, was dead and is alive again. Get the fatted calf. Let's kill it. Let's have a party and be merry. Right? It's amazing. So they're all having a party. And the older son comes home, sees this celebration. Everybody's dancing. They're partying. They're having a good time. And he asks one of the servants, he says, what's going on in here? And they say, oh, your, your, your younger brother's home. And they're celebrating. Your father got the fatted calf and killed it, and they're having a celebration in honor of him being home. And he got angry. Wasn't happy that his brother was home. Angry. He said, that's not fair. Here I am being faithful. And this punk comes along, this bum who makes all these bad decisions, and he gets the fatted calf, and he gets honored and celebrated. I'm not going in there. He's in bondage. Check out the bondage in his heart. His dad comes out and he says, come on, come on in, pleads with him. This is what he says in verse 19, the son, the older son. He says, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving away for you. It's like a teenager after 20 minutes of chores, right? 
I've been slaving. I've been doing nothing but slaving. Right? And watch the extreme language. And never have I disobeyed you. Lie. I mean, unless he's, his name's Jesus, he's lying. All right? Yet, here it is again. You never gave me even a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. Another lie. Remember how the story started out? The father divided un, amongst both of them the inheritance. Right? And by the way, in Jewish culture, because he was the older son, he would have got double all the other assembly, uh, of what the other siblings would have received. That means he got two-thirds of the estate. His younger brother only got one-third. I can picture his father looking at him like, I never gave you a goat. I gave you two-thirds of the company. Like, what are you talking about, right? And, and, I, and I love how, like, his, his father is, is, is calling him out. He's, he's, this, this guy's believing a lie. He, he, he's, he's in bondage to self-pity and bitterness, right? Jealousy. He has, a, he has an envy spirit in there, controlling him, persuading him. Hey, church, can I, can I tell you something? Please hear me. We're getting ready to close here in a minute. It, it's time to slam the door, shut the door on the enemy's lies and begin to walk in freedom. But you have to choose to reject his lies every day because he's not going to stop lying. Verse 31, I love how the father reacted. He says, my son, the father said, you are always with me. Like you've been believing a lie, but I'm going to drop some truth on you. And everything I have is yours. Brings us to point number four and then we're going to close. So, so, so number one, admit that you, have, you need freedom. Number two, humbly repent to God and others. Number three, daily choose to reject Satan's lies. And here's number four, daily choose to receive God's truth. Daily choose to receive God's truth. And sadly, many Christians don't know what that truth is. It's, it's actually tucked into the story. There, there are three truths that we need to settle as believers. Remember what he got from the, from the younger son got from the father when he showed up? He says, bring the, the robe and give it to him. It's the robe of righteousness. Can I see that slide? One more. There it is. It's the robe of righteousness, right? The, ro- the robe of righteousness. Listen, you need to settle it in your heart once and for, for all because, that because of the blood of Jesus, you, you've been placed in right standing with God. And no matter what you've been up to, you have an all paid for access pass to the mercy seat of God to show up and to cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. The second thing the father gave him was the ring of authority. The ring would have had the signet of the family crest. If if any of you have been around for a while, seen the movie Ben-Hur. I know some of you young people are like, Ben-Hur, what, who? Ben-Hur, you guys remember the story? Right? In the movie, they, they had that, fam, that ring, and he puts it into some clay as a signet of the family. It was, it was kind of like... If you wore the ring of the family, it gave you the authority to, to do business on behalf of the family. Like you can actually come into contractual agreements. with, with the, It's like signing your name on the dotted line of the contract. It gave you authority to use the family name. And can I tell you something? Listen, you as a born-again believer, you have God's family ring on you. I, I'm just telling you this morning... In the, you have authority to use the name of Jesus as a member of God's own, very own household. Amen. And I, I'm telling you this morning, it is time for believers to stop allowing the enemy to, to push them around, to hold them in bondage in areas of their life and begin to rise up and take authority in Jesus' name. Like, that's it. Come Get to a point and just say, listen, you've got to go. In Jesus' name, you got to go. I command you to leave my family and my life alone. Amen. And guess what? In Jesus' name, he has to leave. Yes, he does. Well, Pastor Doug, I, I've done that. Doesn't leave. Stays there. You only think he stays there. Can I tell you how it look, works? This is, how this, this is how this looks in the spirit realm. You've got to go in Jesus' name. I command you to leave my life in Jesus' name. And and the enemy goes like this. I ain't leaving. Nope. I'm not going anywhere. You still got that problem. I'm still with you. 
I'm not going. Nope, I'm not leaving. Nope, I'm still there. Can't you tell I'm still there? I'm not going anywhere. I'm still around. I'm not leaving. I'm not gone. I haven't left. But in Jesus' name, he has to leave. He does. Amen? Some of you have settled in your mind who you are in Christ. And the third thing he did for him is he gave him the shoes of peace. He would have come home from the hog pen. His feet would have been disgusting. They would have been dirty and caked on with who knows what. <laughs> and he would have got in there and they would, first thing they would have done was they would have sat him down and they would have cleaned his feet. You know why they do that? Because they don't want the stain of where you've been to be tracked into where you're going. That's a word for somebody in here right now. Tweet that, by the way, okay? Right? But the Father did something above that. He says, let's bring some new shoes. Let's, let's get the shoes of comfort, peace, and let's put it on him. And they put on him like that. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about our spiritual armor. And one of the things that we get is our feet, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of what? The gospel of peace. Peace breeds confidence. Like I don't, I don't ever, I don't ever go to sleep at night and wonder if the sun is going to be up in the morning. I don't ever. You just like you don't think about it, do you? We need to have that kind of confidence with the word and the promises of God. See, I have, I, I've settled it in my heart. I've got peace. There, there's, a, there's a confidence in my spirit that I have the robe of righteousness. I, I, I am who God says I am. I have access, all paid access path to the mercy seat. And I have the ring of authority to use the name of Jesus to stay free and clear from the enemy's attacks on my life and to use it. And I've got peace. I've, I've got peace. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you will speak to my brothers and sisters today. There are people in the room right now who are dealing with things that are tough and things that have kind of held on to them for so long and they're, they're, there's, there's a spirit of discouragement that feels like it's rising up on them, like I can't seem to, like this is just one season after the next, like one wave after the other. I pray, Father God, that you will lift them up today. Like you said in your word, lift them up out of that miry clay. Set their feet upon a rock. Establish their goings, I pray. Get, put a new song in their heart. I pray over every one of my brothers and sisters today who are struggling with something that they can't seem to let go of. And, and by the authority that has been given to me, by the name and the blood of Jesus, I command that foul spirit to leave their life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, like every, everybody in this room right now, if there's something, whether you're a first-time visitor uh, or you're on the leadership team here, it doesn't really matter who you are right now. If there's an area of your life that you need God to set you free from, there's an area that just seems like it's just, it's just, a, it's, it's just on, it's on repeat mode right there, right? I'm just going to challenge you to get the boldness to just stand up right where you're at. I'm going to pray for you. If you're watching online right now, come on, stand up from that couch. Pray for you too. Everybody in here who has an area that you need, you want, you want there are going to be some people get set free here today. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to speak this over you right now. Father, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to release me from every bondage in Jesus' name. Lord, right now, by the authority you've given to me, I take authority over every spirit of bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, hate, malice, envy, jealousy, and I command you to go in Jesus' name. I rebuke every spirit of insecurity, inferiority, rejection, self-hate, self-pity, self-destruction. In Jesus' name, you gotta go. 
You spirit of suicide, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of anger, rage, short temper, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of lust or sexual immorality, impurity, adultery, pornography, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every Jezebel spirit, every spirit of pride, lying spirit, rebellion, deception, manipulation, control, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every critical spirit, judgmental spirit, arrogance, prejudice, racism, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of greed, materialism, covetousness, self-ambition, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of depression, anxiety, worry, fear, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of legalism, religious pride, heresy, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of laziness, slothfulness, unbelief, rebellion to authority, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of guilt, shame, embarrassment, humiliation, condemnation, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of sickness, disease, infirmity, chronic health issues, I command you to go in Jesus' name. For every generational curse, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of witchcraft, the occult, blasphemy, I rebuke every curse, every negative word, or every spell that's been spoken over my brothers and sisters, and I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every demonic spirit that has held my brothers and sisters in bondage, I command you to go in Jesus' you give the Lord a shout. Hey, listen to me this morning. I want you to do this right now. I want you to do this. Put your hands like that. Just put your hands right here like that. I want you to pray this out loud. Say this after me. Holy Spirit. Spirit. Say it like you mean it. Come on, ready? Holy Spirit, I invite you to come here here and invade those new empty spaces that that have been swept clean. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, your freedom and power freedom is already power at work in my life. Is already at work in my life. Because whom the Son sets free, because whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. Is free indeed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord say this: there is freedom. There is freedom. Say this out loud like you mean it. And because of that, and because of that, I am free. I am free indeed. indeed. Hey, your name is.
dismiss you right now, but I want to extend the opportunity for you to come forward for some extension of prayer. We can pray for you, and then uh, and then we'll be out of here this morning. But I do have a question. If, you, if you're here this morning or you're watching online and you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, I simply want to invite you to know him. Just simply say this after me, dear Lord Jesus. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm asking that you forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. By faith, I'm making my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, rule and reign in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that real simple prayer, we believe you got born again today. We want to hear from you when you talk to us afterwards today. And if you're watching online, if you did that, click the comment link, say, Pastor, I raised my hand. I did it. God bless you. If you need prayer today, stick around a little bit. Uh, otherwise, God bless you guys. Listen, there's a whole bunch of food out there. You guys can get something to eat. And uh, uh, God bless you. Father, dismiss us now with your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.